I am the Candle President is. today at Press Club AUST, and you can also use the hashtag NPC. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Paul Lusty. Thanks, Sabra. And thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. I grew up jumping off the dollarite columns of the Devonport coast into the cool ocean waters of northwest Tasmania. It's a place we call the Hat, a place of beauty scattered with ancient Aboriginal petroglyphs. Through my school years, we were told that Tasmania no longer had any Aboriginal people. This wasn't true. That denial of truth is part of the ongoing dispossession and extinguishment faced by the Palawa people, the many First Nations across Tasmania, their rich history erased through violence and perpetuated through silence in the stories we passed on to the next generation. As a nation, we have a long way to go in reconciling with the truths of what happened across this country. We can't end the injustices facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people if we don't first say what they are. That is why I today start by respectfully acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and recognise their sovereignty was never ceded. I also recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will create a lasting legacy for future generations. I want to speak today about Australian democracy and about GetUp's work to open up participation in our democratic system. And I want to tackle some of the misunderstandings about our model. And I want to touch on our vision for Australia's future. I feel honoured to lead this organisation. It's an improbable job for a kid who grew up in northwest Hazzy, with a mum who worked nights as a midwife in the local public hospital, and a dad who was a beekeeper, then a refrigeration mechanic. Events early in my life made me think about how decisions made a long way away can really affect your life. In the early 90s, my dad was in a major workplace accident, surviving with third degree acid burns for most of his body, spending long periods in and out of hospital, and without healthcare, public healthcare, that could have been a very different story. In the school holidays, I'd work in the family bee business and imagined a future of working in the local tourism industry. But the business was eroded as logging company guns cut down the leatherwood forests. That's where my political awakening began. As a campaigner, I saw firsthand the tactics used to crush community resistance and shut down dissent. The threats, the lawsuits, the lies. I ended up as a leader on that campaign and we won it. And that changed my life. I saw the possibility of democracy and having an impact. It inspired me to do what I do today. Helping to raise the voices of over a million Get Up members from all corners of the country, Australians who want to make things better, many of whom are finding their voice in politics for the very first time. It's fair to say that Australians have a pretty healthy scepticism about politicians. But something else is afoot today. Not the normal healthy suspicion that's always been part of our political culture. A much deeper anger about the whole system. A University of Canberra study last year found that public satisfaction with Australia's democracy has crashed from 86% in 2007 to just 41% last year. And that was before the change of Prime Minister. We saw that firsthand, actually. Almost 10,000 Get Up volunteers put in 37,404 hours simply talking to people on their phones and on their doorsteps in nearly every state, in nearly every demographic, about the issues that matters, the policy options and why they should vote for change. What we found, though, was alarming. It's as if something had snapped. We were shaken by the depth of hopelessness and cynicism across the community, like politics is something that's been tried, failed, and they've given up. People were only half joking when they asked what the Prime Minister's name was. 
they talked about their frustration that nobody listens to them because they don't have bags of money to throw around. They despaired about the lack of any vision to tackle the big complex problems like unemployment, climate change or the drought. Politics seems now singularly incapable of addressing these things and many Australians feel powerless to do anything about it. Many no longer believe politics can make anything in their lives better. That's one part of the story we found on the doorstep. But the other side of each doorstep was a GetUp member, no less frustrated but responding differently, rolling up their sleeves and getting stuck in, often for the very first time. GetUp this year was inundated with volunteers, three times as many this time around as compared to 2016, almost 10,000 people desperate for a better politics and a better future. People like Vanita Rachandri in Western Sydney, who was a regular donor until, like a growing number of Australian women in their 50s and 60s, she was made redundant, well before she was ready to retire. She works a few jobs these days, but one she enjoys most is running exams at a local high school. They don't have air conditioning, and in a typical summer these days, the temperature can get to 47 degrees. Vanita migrated to Australia in 1981, the year I was born, believing Australia was a land of promise, a land of fairness. And it's a source of great personal pride for me to know that GetUp's work reflects something of that vision in the Australia that first inspired her. Vanita picked up the phone in GetUp's election campaign because, in her words, people have no idea what representatives are voting for in their name. GetUp's starting point is this. The more people like Vanita that are involved in the decisions that affect their lives, the better. Politics affects everyone, so politics should belong to everyone. GetUp was born in the 21st century, so our model is different to traditional politics and civil society campaigning, which makes it easily and often misunderstood or misrepresented. Our model is built on ordinary people, our members, taking action on issues they care about. Our staff are accountable to our members who tell us what they care about through surveys, person-to-person -person interactions with staff and multiple other feedback loops, like every time we put a campaign in front of them. Does the campaign resonate with people's lives? Does it inspire action? Does it excite more Australians to join the cause? Will they give up their time to write a submission, email their local member, talk to a friend or a neighbour? And yes, will they donate their money to secure change on the issues they care about? If they do none of these things, there is simply no Get Up campaign. Full stop. In fact, there is no get up. So let me explain how we are funded. 95% of all our donations from everyday people, they're small donations. They're less than 100 bucks, an average of $24 per contribution. We occasionally do get some larger donations. In the last financial year, there were six above $50,000. But unlike major parties, we dispend on those small donors. And in the last year, there are almost 50,000 individual people 20,000 of them were donating to get up for the very first time. We are a crowd-funded organisation, and there's no funding without the crowd. This gives GetUp members much more power over the direction of our organisation than a political party member or even a shareholder or board of directors. We cannot power a campaign for any length of time without the literal buy-in of our members. Much of the confusion, though, about GetUp comes, I think, from our involvement in elections. Of course, GetUp's work is political, but it's not partisan. Those two things shouldn't be confused. It's worth quoting here from GetUp's statement of independence. This is something our members have endorsed very specifically by donating to fund numerous full page ads, setting it out in black and white. We judge parties and politicians by their policies values and character, not their brand. We are beholden to no one but each other and our shared values. Together we pressure, persuade and work with those inside and outside government who can deliver real change on the issues that drive us without ever giving or receiving money or direction from any political party, politician or candidate. Our political independence has been confirmed by the Australian Electoral Commission on no thorough than three separate reviews when they found we are not an associated entity of any political party. But do we get involved in elections? 
Absolutely. It's the time when the greatest number of Australians are thinking about political issues. Parties and policies are always the loudest voices talking to voters in elections. They frame the issues and often that they are the only ones urging a vote one way or another. And that's fine, but they shouldn't have a monopoly. For us, these are critical moments to affect change on the issues our members care about, giving voters clear information about how voting is a way that they can influence the issues they want to see politicians act on. Do we sometimes take positions against MPs from the Liberal Party? Yes, but not just the Liberal Party. Indeed, we sometimes work with the Liberal Party, as happened in our grassroots campaign efforts for marriage equality two years ago. As you may have heard, we were active in Warringah this year, and we found remarkable enthusiasm from many in the Liberal Party for our efforts there. Our focus is not the party or the labels. It's the issues, the values, and the outcomes. That's why we get stuck in on these issues. Let me give you two recent examples. GetUp members have charged us to shine a light on this government's cruel and inhumane treatment of asylum seekers. In 2017, they supported GetUp's human rights team going undercover into the Manus Island Detention Centre, bringing back the first ever footage taken by an independent or outside organisation. Members also want us to help Australians find out what life's like on the dismal New Start payment. So we've elevated voices for people living on New Start by bringing their stories direct to Canberra. A key part of our model is an unusual level of transparency. We believe in sunlight. It's through ongoing conversations with our members that GetUp has built and maintained their trust. For example, we publish the source of all major donations over $10,000 on our website within 30 days, better than any of the political parties, who often don't disclose until as much as a year after an election has occurred. Our website provides a snapshot of donations that is updated every single day. We regularly open events across the country, talking publicly to thousands of people about what our strategies are. They're not hidden. We're radically transparent about how we communicate with our members, even posting online the members' calling scripts for when they're chatting to voters. I'm not sure any other organisation is so open, and certainly this has given me my fair share of grey hairs. It makes, if we make mistakes, people quickly know about it. But this is the sort of transparency, this is the sort of new power that our model is really all about. Yet a few months ago, the freshly elected Prime Minister stepped up to the Liberal Party podium at the conference to talk not about the real issues facing Australia today, but to make wild claims about us operating in the shadows, about whinging that, and whipping up outrage about GetUp members' involvement in the election. I don't often quote Janet Albrechtson, but she put it best when she said, <laughs> getting angry at GetUp is akin to getting angry at democracy. I like that so much, I think I should get it put on a T-shirt. <laughs> so let's get a sense of proportion about the Prime Minister's attack. GetUp's small donor network helped marshal a total election event investment of $3.5 million. Clive Palmer marshaled $60 million. There's simply no level playing field when a Clive Palmer can wash our whole country's smartphones, laptops, and just add about every spare billboard with a sea of icky yellow. But instead, Palmer gets a pat on the back, while GetUp gets a slap in the face. The double standard here drives us nuts. There's not a peep from the Prime Minister about the threat posed by money and politics that helps him get in power by millionaires operating in the shadows or the influence of industry lobby groups like the Minerals Council. But because we're not a Liberal Party surrogate, it's GetUp that gets attacked. Scott Morrison might not share GetUp's members' values or priorities. But when an organisation like GetUp empowers hundreds of thousands of Australians to jump in, have their voices heard, and join with other people to fight for issues they care about, you'd think he could at least acknowledge how good is democracy? <laughs> Instead, the Prime Minister seems hell-bent on crushing us tying us up in legal wrangles, tossing out slurs and innuendos about our members making it impossible to have our voices heard. 
What's happening in Australia under the Morrison government feels increasingly like what other grassroots campaign groups around the world have been experiencing. As Yasser Monk, one of the world's leading thinkers on populism, wrote in his recent book, The People First Democracy, citizens have long been disillusioned with politics. Now they have a growing, restless, angry, even disdainful, and fed up with political democracy itself. Authoritarian populists are on the rise around the world, from America to Europe, from Asia to Australia. The question now is whether this populist moment will turn into a populist age and cast the very survival of liberal democracy into doubt. Democracy everywhere is under attack from right-wing authoritarian populists who divide their countries into us versus them and then try to silence their opponents. From the US to the Philippines, from the UK to Brazil. This is not conservatism. They're undermining traditional institutions, weakening the rule of law and destroying democratic norms. As Malcolm Turnbull said last week, the term conservative is being debauched by politicians better thought of as reactionaries or authoritarian populists. I don't believe for a minute that Australians want a trump light Prime Minister, but week by week we're seeing more signs of this government fashioning itself on the authoritarian populist playbook. Facts get twisted and things get made up against us. Like his slur that get up a misogynist, knowing an echo chamber will repeat this lie and if it's repeated enough, people will start believing it. We see him imitating Trump's absolutism with the obliteration of complexity in the political debate. You either agree with him or you're an enemy. Even big business is copying attacks when they step out of line and criticise the government. Instead of engaging in an argument and talking about substance, we get this brittle authoritarian reflex. Another part of the authoritarian playbook is silencing dissent. Whether it is the media, whistleblowers or NGOs, anyone who disagrees with this government is being made an enemy who must be destroyed or utterly discredited. The raids by armed police on the ABC and Anika Smethurst's home this year are so unprecedented they have attracted international attention and condemnation. A government committed to free speech would be fixing the broken law to prevent their chilling effects on journalists, media outlets and whistleblowers. This matters profoundly for our democracy, accountability and stopping corruption and the abuse of power. The way GetUp is now being targeted for investigation comes straight from this same playbook. We've already gone through three AEC investigations into our independence, triggered by government complaints. The most recent one lasted 20 months and finished just three months before the election this year. Once again, the AEC found that facts proved our independence. But the Prime Minister now wants yet another investigation. Meanwhile, we're under scrutiny from the ATO following a referral from the good Senator Erica Betts. Again, this came from a groundless report by an ex-Liberal candidate during the election campaign. A few weeks back, we received a ruling that, no surprises here, confirmed GetUp is doing the right thing. But it's another instance of government using their power to clamp down on their enemies, in this case, leaning on an independent regulator. Later this month, we'll be facing up to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The chair of that committee has already publicly laid out the government's agenda to silence dissent by locking out issue-based campaigners and making it harder for people to vote. The point of all these inquiries and attacks isn't to get a finding against us. They never have. The point is to smear, discredit, cast a slur and raise a doubt. Again, it's straight from that same playbook. Tie up the resources of an organisation that demand accountability, democracy and openness, so we are less able to campaign on the issues our members really care about and create change. We'll defend our members, but we'll keep advancing our vision for a better and stronger democracy. I want to finish by mentioning two priorities of our work as we look to 2020. The first is defending democracy from attacks, like those threatening press freedom. We've recently taken a petition of over 100,000 Australians for a Media Freedom Act to Parliament. 
when the Senate forced an independent inquiry into press freedom against government resistance, Getter members made submissions by the thousands. We heard from farmers who have relied on Radio National for decades, medical students anxious that they could speak out about dangers in the public health care system without facing prosecution. We heard from the Liberal Party voters too, appalled by this government's illiberalism. We've got a forward agenda to rid elections of the corrupting influence of big money. At the upcoming Electoral Matters Inquiry, we'll join with others in urging expenditure caps for elections. Essential as donation reforms are, expenditure caps tackle the demand side of the problem. If politicians can't spend, they don't need to raise it. If they don't need to raise it, wealthy donors and corporates won't have the power to subvert democracy. No more Clive Palmer's and his $60 million sea of yellow. A second priority is the climate crisis. No issue has great, more greatly sapped faith in our politics and especially that of younger Australians. There's simply no leadership from this government. We know this government's record. Cuts to the CSIRO, gutting ARENA, attacking renewables, gagging public servants, gaslighting the international community and voters about progress against our commitments. After this year's election, I fear the government will only go harder in polarising the community. Sissies versus regions, farmers versus miners, workers versus activists. If that's their calculation, I think it's wrong. Morally and strategically, because community attitudes are shifting, people are mobilising and leaders are speaking out. Farmers are suffering through unprecedented droughts. Communities like Walgett are running out of drinking water. Bushfires through winter and spring ravaging parts of Queensland and New South Wales. From teachers sweltering with their students in demountables to builders <coughs> labouring through record heat waves to nurses seeing a surge in the heat strokes in overcrowded wards, this is becoming a conversation everywhere. New voices are adding their calls for a serious approach to the long-term climate crisis. Like Defence Force Chief Angus Campbell, who has noted that increasingly frequent natural disasters caused by climate change could stretch the capability of the Australian Defence Force. And, this, and the National Farmers Federation saying that farmers believe the science. They believe what they're seeing with their own eyes. And the Reserve Bank's Financial Stability Review released last Friday, highlighting the need for investors to actively manage carbon risk. And the Australian Medical Association declaring climate change is a health emergency. Australians are getting it, but our politics is stuck. And the people power is the only way that we can change that, to get us beyond the politics of us versus them, winners versus losers, of the past versus the future. The Prime Minister has a choice. He can change course, drop the playground politics and bring our cities and regions together around a truly transformative plan. If he had the political courage to face down the hard right in his own party, he could be truly transformative. He could be a real leader. But our members aren't going to sit around waiting for a miracle. They're coming together around a unifying vision for climate action that takes us beyond winners and losers and the culture war over climate. That's why since 2017, our members have been pushing for ambitious and urgent investments, including a federal job guarantee as the foundation for a just transition for workers and the communities which are most at risk. We are also working with First Nations communities and leaders who are organising and building power to protect their community and their country. As I speak to you today, Get Up members are standing with traditional owners from the Northern Territory, outside and inside the Origin Energy AGM, protesting fracking plans that would destroy sacred sites and threaten water sources. This is some of the most critical work, work that Get Up is doing. So let me say this to the Prime Minister on behalf of Get Up's million members. Prime Minister, if you're serious about being a leader of our times, tackling Australia's big challenges, restoring trust in our democracy, building bridges and listening to all Australians, we'll back you all the way. 
But if you just want us to sit down, shut up, and become the quiet Australians who let you do whatever you like and never challenge you, then our message is this. Get Up's million members won't be silenced. Politics is for everyone, and we love our democracy. So we're not going to go quiet, and we're not going to give up. We're going to get up every day and defend our rights and defend the voices who you won't listen to, the voices of the next and future generations who have nothing but fury for this generation who has failed to tackle our climate crisis, the voices of people who year after year kept living in poverty, skipping meals and essential medicines to survive on the inadequate New start allowance. The voices of First Nations people who are still being marginalised and disrespected by our governments. The voices of the everyday Australians who are Get Up. I've spoken today about Get Up's work, our values and commitments, our policy priorities and our response to the attacks, and our commitment to democracy. But all of this boils down to something very simple. Everyday Australians feeling heard for the first time, having a sense of agency, being a citizen, and not just being a subject. The privilege of democracy. One of GetUp's volunteers this year was a woman from Wollongong named Kasana. Kasana was battling with terminal cancer and had become too sick to leave her house. But she wasn't too sick to pick up the phone. So through the election campaign, Kasana spent hours making phone calls to voters in Warringah. It was important for her to have her final say in the future of the country that she loved. Kasana is no longer with us. But after she died, one of her friends contacted us to let us know that those calls were the thing she was most proud of at the end of her life. That is what Get Up is about. Our mission is to tear down the barriers that stand between ordinary people and politics, to give every single one of us, no matter our age, postcode, our ability, or the colour of our skin, a say in the future of the country they call home. For me, a working class kid from North West Tassie, it's an incredible privilege to lead and serve this movement. The optimism, energy and enthusiasm of the thousands of Get Up members I've met across the country inspires me every single day. And it's a privilege today to bring their voices to the nation's capital and to you. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Paul. So from what you're saying, you spent $3.5 million in total on the election campaign this year. The GetUp targeted six coalition uh, Liberal MPs, Peter Dutton, Greg Hunt, Tony Abbott, Kevin Andrews, Nicole Flint and Christian Porter. Tony Abbott lost his seat and there are many people who say that GetUp had little influence on that because he was responsible for his own uh, unpopularity. Um, do you bear responsibility then for the fact that your millions didn't unseat any of the other MPs? And in fact, there's an argument that people have put that GetUp's presence, for example, in Dixon, had the opposite effect. It actually boosted Peter Dutton's popularity. Well, firstly, I, you know, I don't think that's right. Um, Peter Dutton um, faced uh, a much smaller swing than other parts of Queensland. And whilst it's true to say, it's you know, undoubtedly a fact that when we're sitting here today having not achieved our, our objectives in the election campaign, and we've been reflecting on that and how we can work differently as a movement going forward, I'm certainly very proud of the campaign that GetUp members ran together. Um, we all fed in on what our priorities should be, what are the issues we should work on, who are those that we wanted to focus our energies on. We chose the hard right faction of the coalition. Uh, many of those um, are in what are traditionally deemed to be safe seats um, with where things were going, um, or where we thought things were going with the polling. Um, that's where we decided to work, and it's you know, undoubtedly that we would do things differently if we had that opportunity again. But we have come out of it with some real strengths, as I outlined in the speech. We've got a lot to be proud of in the 10,000 people, um, almost half of whom have stepped up into politics for the very first time who have really 
broadened and deepened this movement and they're more passionate than ever now to keep getting involved and not waiting for the next election, getting involved right now. We have to find a solution to the ma major crises that are facing our country, unemployment and the climate crisis. The IPCC says that we only have 12 years left to address climate change. Three of those years are going to occur under this government, so we have to move on from the election that occurred five months ago and continue to try and find ways to make progress on the issues our members care about. You also seem to be saying that voters got it wrong this year. The, the government's climate change policy was well known and people voted for it. Well, look, I think there's been a, you know, a lot, of, um, lot of commentary around the election campaign from um, Scott Morrison's you know, fear ca tax campaign to the performance of the Labor Party, their messages and messenger. But you know, what we're focused on now is how do we try and find ways to address not just climate change, but the other issues that people are facing in their lives. When we look at parts of regional Australia with a huge unemployment rates, particularly youth unemployment, we know that we need to find solutions for those things. And I think that was one element that has been missing from the solutions that people are t putting forward to those parts of regional Australia. So there's work still to go. All right. Jade Galeberger. Jade Gailberger from the Advertiser newspaper. Thank you for your speech. Um, I'd like to take you back to the election, particularly your campaign in the South Australian seat of Boothby. Uh, Liberal Nicole Flint said she credited GetUp and the unions for creating an environment where abuse, harassment and intimidation became the new normal, claims that you've rejected. The PM said the vandalism and the vile personal attacks prompted him to announce another investigation into GetUp. Touching on Sabra's question before, given Miss Flint wasn't able, like, wasn't unseated during the campaign and she held on with small margin, do you regret anything during that campaign and the backlash that has come from it and do you deem it a success? Well, firstly, to um, you know, clear up those, those claims made by um, Scott Morrison there, but have been made without any evidence. Um, they're completely false. Um, and as I outlined in my speech, these are deliberate attempts to try and smear our organisation. Um, in the seat of Booth, we, we spoke to voters there. We had heart-to-heart -heart conversations about the issues that mattered to our movement. Um, we're confident in the work that we did. We condemned the sort of behaviours conducted by others um, when it occurred from Boothby to Warringah, uh, where um, we, women were targeted in the election campaign. So um, we're confident that the claims made. Um, certainly there's been no evidence put forward. They're completely without substance and we'll continue to make sure um, that we abide by a clear code of contact with all the work that our volunteers do. And to the last point of that question, do you deem it a success? Well, um, it's not, it's, it's, if you look at the results, it's not the objective that we were aiming for. Um, we've got to look now at how we move forward. We've, we've done that as a movement and we're moving on to how we can still try and create change on the issues that our members care about. Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Thanks for your speech, Paul. Um, you spoke, obviously, about the importance of climate change to get up as, as an area for the organisation to campaign on, to continue campaigning on. The Labor Party's currently sort of turning itself in knots over what they do about their emissions reduction targets you know, around retaining 45% or going lower and matching what the government's doing. If the Labor Party does sort of uh, go for a lower target and, and matches, as, as Joel Fitzgibbon has suggested, the sort of the 28 per cent target that we're currently committed to under the Paris Agreements, will you target Labor MPs like Mr Fitzgibbon and other candidates like that? Will you spread your, um, your focus to that as well, or will you continue just to focus on coalition MPs? Well, our immediate priority has to be on the government. The government are the ones who need to act on climate change. Um, the IPCC says we have just 12 years left to solve the problem of climate change. Three of those years will occur under this government. At the moment, they have a climate policy that was written by a climate denier. We have emissions going up. We have renewable energies target under attack. We have the leading renewable energy agency about to be closed down. And so we have some urgent work to do to try and find ways as a community to make progress on climate change. That, that is absolutely 
absolutely the most urgent and most important thing that we as a community can be doing right now. Um, we absolutely do not support Joel Fitzgibbon's calls for a lowering of um, targets. We need more ambition. We need greater solutions to the climate crisis. We need greater solutions to unemployment in regional Australia. We need to find solutions that both address climate change and meet the needs of everyday people's lives at the same time. That's the right direction and I believe whether it's Scott Morrison or Anthony, Anthony Albanese, any politician will be rewarded if they can put forward real and meaningful solutions to those issues. Do you understand though why you know, average Australians might sit at home and think, hang on, there's a Labor MP advocating exactly the same policy of the government but you're saying we're not going to target him? That, and they see that through a political prism and think you're picking just on one side. Well, no, I, I criticise where Joel Fitzgibbon's coming from. I think it's the wrong direction for the Australian government. Um, but, but I also think we need to focus on who's in power. Um, when, when Labor was in power, we targeted them on many issues. We campaigned against the Labor Party on marriage equality. The Gillard government, sadly, unsuccessfully. Um, we, you know, we focused on one of my first campaign involvements was uh, targeting the Tasmanian Labor Premier. Paul Lennon on the issue of uh, the guns proposed pulp mill and the political corruption surrounding that issue. We've targeted Labor Premier uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk over the Adani coal mine. It's the nature of campaigning that you want to get the change and the people in power can deliver the change. Um, but yes, we absolutely think that Labor and the Coalition's policies on climate change should be ambitious, but they also need to look at the real challenges facing um, particularly regional Australia, but um, people's lives as they face the real blunt um, brunt of climate change impacts um, and the transition away from fossil fuels. Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Um, just following up from Sabra's question, um, not only were your tactics um, a failure in knocking off MPs, they had, a, they had knock on benefits for Scott Morrison because the language used about climate change by activist groups marginalised people in regional areas and coal, coal communities. I mean, you talk about just transitions, people who need a job in the coal sector to put food on the table, they didn't believe these jobs would exist in the future. To them, it sounded mythical. So in future campaigns, will you be more empathetic to people who are worried about climate change policies and try and persuade them to your cause? Or will you just tell climate change sceptics, will you sneer at them, tell them they're bad and evil, and do the same for politicians that you disagree with in this space? Well, I think there's two parts to your question. Um, as I've outlined, I think we absolutely, we, the Australian people, government, and everyone involved in these discussions, need to do more to address the real challenges facing those communities that are on the front line of climate impacts. We need to do more to address the real challenges they're facing in their lives. High unemployment, a precarious um, workplace situation, a, a transition away from fossil fuels and communities that have historically been dependent on it, bushfires ravaging these communities, drought in some areas, floods in others. So we need to do more to bring forward and make sure we have solutions and um, real deep empathy and, and engagement with those communities and the problems that they're facing. So that is absolutely something that I wholeheartedly agree with. And I absolutely encourage all people that engage in the political process to take that approach. Um, in terms of engaging with climate deniers, we don't engage with climate deniers and we'd encourage others to do the same. <laughs> Paul. Paul Karp. Paul Karp from Guardian Australia. Thanks very much for your speech. I wanted to pick up on your comments about the deep anger in the electorate and the sense of hopelessness that people have and suggest that that's particularly a problem for the progressive side of politics because people feel that government can't solve their problems. Mm. Um, but the sorts of things that people complain about are that they don't know who to believe, that politics is too negative, there's too much name calling and that they feel that all politicians are as bad as each other. So I wanted to ask what response Responsibility does get up take for running overwhelmingly negative campaigns, and how can you restore faith in politics rather than just bag conservatives? 
I mean, firstly, I don't accept that we ran an overly negative campaign. Um, we were out there talking about issues. Um, we're talking about the issues that our membership truly believe we need to make progress on. We're talking about issues that, in many cases, we were hearing back from people in the communities that they were raising. Um, in terms of restoring trust, um, we'll be taking to the Electoral matter Matters Inquiry a range of measures that we believe will set Australia on the right course to do that. We think there needs to be greater transparency. Um, GetUp has voluntarily taken a range of measures, I'd, I'd argue we're the most transparent um, organisation in Australian politics, but it should be a level playing field. There should be legislation to have real-time disclosure about the money that's coming into politics. We know from um, talking to people that that's one of the things that actually erodes people's trust. Secondly, we need to have expenditure caps. We need to deal with the demand side of the problem. There, sh there shouldn't be huge amounts of unlimited money flowing into Australian politics from, from mining companies, from other vested interests, and that's the best way to deal with, I think, restoring trust in our democracy. Max Kozlowski. Max Kozlowski from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Thanks for that speech, Paul. Um, you mentioned briefly in that speech that 100,000 people signed the petition uh, for press freedom and the um, Media uh, Freedom Act. Uh, my question is about that. One of the criticisms against the whole press freedom idea is that it's something discussed amongst journalists uh, and that it doesn't have much traction in the broader community. From your experience, does it have longevity? Uh, do you think it's a vulnerability of the Morrison government, the way that they're approaching press freedom? Um, and in terms of practicalities, uh, what's your plans on press freedom? Will it be a campaign for you guys in the future? And if so, what resources will you pump into it? Yeah, look, our members um, are hugely committed to the cause of press freedom. Um, you know, I think the raids on the home of Anika Smethurst, um, armed police going into the ABC offices, um, we're in a sense the tip of the iceberg. These, as I mentioned, faced international condemnation. Um, they're not the sort of thing that people expect to see in a Western democracy. And people around the world are absolutely shocked by what's occurring here. But as I say, it is the tip of the iceberg whether it's um, the weakening of um, privacy laws, the collection of metadata, um, the, the funding cuts to our public broadcasters, all of these things are whittling away at the ability of journalists, of whistleblowers and other institutions to bring the truth to light. And I do think and know that Australians care about that. Um, people, uh, the ABC is still one of the most trusted institutions in Australia. Um, there's a reason for that. It brings people um, those sort of expos that make them feel like politicians and those in power are being held to account. Um, since the election, this has been the campaign our members have most actively engaged in, so we're committed to it for the long haul. Uh, it is a very deep issue because of the nature of the, the wide array of legislation that cuts across this issue. Um, we've put forward the Press Freedom Act. It's one that we think needs to have serious consideration, and I do think it's a risk for the Morrison government to continue down the pathway of eroding civil liberties of weakening um, privacy and security of whistleblowers um, and journalists, and it's something that needs to be taken seriously far beyond the press uh, gallery as to where we are today, and I think that it is. Um, forgive me for noticing this. You referred to the ABC a couple of times in your speech, and ABC then during uh, the uh, answer to that question, but you can't bring yourself to say that Annika Smith Hurst works for the News Corporation. Well, no, we absolutely su um, support um, News Corp's right to bring um, the truth to light. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's their role. Um, all journalists from all outlets have a big role um, in doing this. Uh, I mentioned Anika because I think um, you know, it's particularly, um, uh, you know, it stands out that it was her home that was raided, whereas it was at the ABC offices. Malcolm Farr. Hi, thanks for your address. Malcolm Farr from news.com.au. No one seriously thinks that Bernie Sanders could defeat Donald Trump next year. Very few people seriously think that uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn could defeat Boris Johnson next month. Does this sort of, and both are champions to differing degrees to the sort of community uh, uh, engagement that, that uh, you're involved in. D does this sort of indicate that the political times just don't suit you? Well, um, thanks. Thank you for the question. I mean, I think I think it's true to say, as I said in my speech, that right-wing authoritarian populist politics is on the rise globally. That, that is 
the times in which we exist. Um, and we have to look at what we do within that context the sort of behaviours, the sort of tactics that are being used by these authoritarian right-wing pop populists. We have to look to what we think can be the best counter to that. Does it mean that we're winning or on the verge of winning? Not necessarily, but we still have to build the solution. And what GetUp believes is the best and most holistic solution is people power, is people getting involved in politics, not stepping back saying, oh my God, this is terrible, I give up, or you know, I pox on all their houses, actually taking ownership, participating in democracy, being part of the solutions. You keep pointing the finger of blame at uh, right-wing figures for democracy having problems at the moment. What, what responsibility do the parties of the left shoulder here and the so-called progressives in, in the erosion of trust and, and belief in democracy? Look, I think it's right to say that there's not been enough done to step up and defend our democratic rights, whether um, it was the bipartisan um, support for a number of the weakening of things like privacy and security laws that we saw in the last term of government. That's problematic and shouldn't be occurring. These, these shouldn't be the sort of issues that people step away from because they're worried about the political wedge. Um, and it's certainly the case that it's not just the domain of right-wing conservatives that are um, attacking uh, uh, freedom of speech and democratic rights. They are the ones who are most responsible and leading the charge, as we're seeing here in Australia by this federal government, as we're seeing around the world from you know, the US to the UK. But we are, we've also seen examples of it, um, like Premier Palaszczuk's um, recent protest laws in Queensland. So it's, it's something that we do need to continue to hold all politicians to account on and push for a greater commitment to democratic participation and a true freedom of speech. David Denham. Thanks very much, Paul. David Denham from Preview magazine. I'd like to look at the global picture a little bit more than you have, because there seems to be a paradox here. All the, the main issues facing humans on the planet are global issues. If you look at climate change, I mean, if the temperatures keep on going, Greenland's going to melt six metres of sea level rise. Um, acidity of the oceans, population, resources, water supplies, and all the rest of it. And yet, at the same time as that's happened, we've got authoritarian governments focused on purely national issues, mm -hmm. the small issues. So you've got Australia, Hungary, UK, US. How on earth do you have any ideas as how we should be tackling these global issues, whereas with the, couple, with the current political establishment, it's going to be very, very difficult because all these people are behaving like dictators? Mm. Look, I think it's a, it's a point well made where we've seen the Prime Minister recently um, sort of sidling up to... Um, President Trump in criticising the United Nations. Um, we, we see the idea that the, we, the global community should work together now um, being something that we should walk away from, that we should just be nativist or national in our approach. Um, you know, as an organisation, Get Up very proudly works um, through an open network. We have uh, now uh, dozens of, mm -hmm. of na nationally based organisations and movements like ours um, across the world from places like Kampakt in Germany to um, Romania and Poland who are trying to use people power to affect change. But we do need to, to recognise that we're, we're all in this together. The IPCC says that globally we have 12 years to solve, solve climate change. Um, no one country can solve that alone. And so that's why I think it is particularly worrying when we see um, national leaders um, trying to weaken international institutions like the UN. Tim Shaw. Uh, thanks, Sabra. Uh, and uh, Paul, thank you for your address. Tim Shaw, member of the National Press Club Board. Uh, Sean Crow is an ANU PhD, and he said this on Twitter last week. It's hard to see how the Extinction Rebellion is going to change Australian policy. But then again, nothing else has. Mm -hmm. Now, looking to your organisation and the remarks that you've made today and following on about negative campaigning, um, you've used Twitter, you've used Facebook, both foreign-owned organisations, I might add, and you've spent substantial amounts 
of your Australian donors' money on foreign companies. I'd like an answer that relates to your investment in mainstream media and narrative here in Australia, um, but particularly your relationship or not with Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Um, well, firstly, we're not involved with the Extinction Rebellion. Um, um, you know, the, the, the Defence Force chief speaking out um, is the government. Uh, they're failing to act. They have a policy written by a climate denier. Emissions are going up. Whilst that's the case, people are going to continue to speak out in, in any way they can. Media spend. Uh, uh, media spend. Um, that's a good question. Um, we, we do we do engage with social media. It's a way where we engage with lots of our people. Um, I, I don't see an obvious alternative to it right now, as people have migrated from tradition, traditional forms of news to engage with people. We, we increasingly try to use those mediums to bring new people into politics. It's, it, it is um, the reality that those are the platforms where we can best do that at the moment. Our club patron, Ken Randall. Uh, Paul, uh, as you've mentioned yourself, GetUp's been around for a while now, um, and uh, during that time, I think the judgment of most people is that political discourse in this country has got worse. Do you find that discouraging, or do you think you've made a difference in stopping it getting even worse? <laughs> I, I would like to think that we've made, uh, stopped it from getting even worse. Um, I would like to think that we uh, have created a model that does show some of the ways in which we can bring more people into politics. Um, the model that GetUp uses is one that's not exclusively ours. Um, we would encourage um, all um, civil society organisations, parties and others to you know, roll up the sleeves get engaged, um, have focused, bringing people in, participating, have that as what we would call your theory of change, the way that you want to take an issue forward. Um, you know, and that entails building trust, having transparency. Um, you know, at the time when the engagement in traditional political parties has been in steady decline, um, the growth and engagement in GetUp has increased exponentially. So I think there is something there that people are willing to engage with us when we're focused on issues, focused on solutions, and present them with meaningful ways to get involved something as simple as participating and shaping the direction of the organisation, making a phone call, going door knocking where they can see that even if it's a moonshot, that if they can do this at scale, maybe, just maybe, we can make a difference. John Millard. Thank you, Sabra. Uh, John Millard, freelance. And thank you very much, Mr. Christie, for your address. Often your campaigns on important issues are exactly that. Floods of letters come in and put in the, the box called, oh my God, not another one of those. How much do you think that more focusing your campaigns with more directed questions might more likely um, have an effect upon ministers and their advisers? Yeah, like I, I agree with that cynicism that um, can creep in from the political elite around um, hearing from the public, um, and that, that it is incumbent, I think, on organisations like ours to find more meaningful ways. Um, you know, we started as an entirely online organisation. Uh, we now have 10,000 people engaged, and these are people who are doing things that most of us probably don't want to do, going door knocking, fronting up to somebody's door to have what can sometimes end up being a 40-minute conversation about a topical like um, the, the investment in the public health care system and why the Launceston Emergency Ward shouldn't be closed down. Um, so I think that's where we've been transitioning um, over the last 12 years, I guess. Um, we'll, um, we're transitioning over time is to find new ways to get those messages heard. Sometimes it's via um, the, the community raising a concern. Sometimes it's trying to influence votes. Sometimes we're trying to find new ways to reach politicians and cut through all the issues that are on their mind. And it's not easy. Thank you. Greg Brown. Greg Brown from The Australian. Just in, um, in your response to my previous question, where you dismissed, I raised people that were concerned about um, policies that will combat climate change. You dismissed them as climate deniers and said you won't engage with them. Do you understand how people in regional communities who you need to win over see that as an insult on their way of life? Like, and it's completely counterproductive to your cause. Like, hasn't the election showed that you need a change in approach? 
Well, you, you used the phrase climate deniers, and I, I, I don't... I said people who were concerned about climate change action, and you, you then came back and mean dismissed them as climate deniers. No, incorrect. You used the phrase climate change... Uh, sorry, climate deniers. Um, I absolutely agree with the point, and I outlined my answer to that in relation to um, people um, in regional areas who are concerned about their future, about jobs, about cost of living. Um, that was my answer to that part of your question. Um, I absolutely think we do need to do more to find solutions to to the climate crisis, to transitioning our energy system and to the real pressures people are facing in their lives. It's absolutely one of the lessons that I've taken away um, from recent times, for the, particularly the federal election campaign. But your use of the term climate deniers, I don't think we engage in that space. I absolutely don't think that's at all representative of my experience of regional Australia. Jade Gale Berger. Jake Elberger from The Advertiser. You've confirmed that GetUp is not involved in the Extinction Rebellion, but what is its involvement with the school climate strikes? Um, well, get up actively encourage people to engage in the climate strikes, um, you know, alongside the other voices that are stepping up into Australian politics right now, calling on this government to act on climate change, from the head of the Defence Force to the AMA to the National Farmers Federation. Um, we encourage people to participate, get out there to mobilise and have their voices heard. Paul Carr. It's a racing season, which means...